So today we are going to be talking about writing items. So we're ready in this module to talk about how to write our own tests. So we're really going to focus the, in the next two weeks on writing classroom assessments. So we'll start off with how to write good multiple choice items. So for this one, writing multiple choice items. And here we go. So the multiple choice items consist of two parts. There's the stem, which is the question. Um, sometimes it's an incomplete statement. And then the alternative. So there's one correct answer. And then there's three or more distractors. So those are the um, alternates, so the alternatives. Um, and the tricky thing about a multiple choice item is really coming up with those distractors so that they are um, things that could plausibly be correct. Um, and um, will serve as, you know, good distractors for the correct answer. So um, when writing multiple choice items for younger children, um, it's best to state the item in the form of a question, not an incomplete statement, and you want to have one correct answer. Um, and that being said, really, when possible, you should make all of your multiple choice items as questions. Um, that really helps with clarity. And our mantra here for writing all test items is we want to be difficult without being tricky. So we're not trying to trick our students into the incorrect answer. We really want to differentiate between those who really truly know the answer and those who don't. Um, when we want to under when we want to measure complex understanding, we're going for the best answers. The distractors may have part of the correct answer while not being fully correct. And as you might have noticed in the celebrations of learning for this class, there's a lot of these complex understandings. So the the correct answer has the complete answer, but those distractors might have parts of the correct answer. So what are some advantages of multiple choice items? Um, we can get a broad sampling of knowledge. So by asking lots of multiple choice questions, we can ask lots of questions um, and students can answer them in a relatively short amount of time. So in an hour long test, you can answer, you can ask lots of multiple choice questions. We can have lots of that item sampling. They're easy to score, so because they're objectively scored, we can even use computers or Scantron machines to score them. Um, they're objective, so that increases that reliability, right? Um, and they're more reliable than binary choice. Why would I say more reliable than binary choice? Right, because binary choice, there's two options, so I have a 50-50 chance of getting it correct. So there's a 50% chance of me guessing the correct answer, so I would get a false positive. So I would get the correct answer even if I didn't actually understand the concept, whereas with multiple choice, I only have a 25% chance of, correct, of guessing the correct response when I don't know the answer. And the other thing that we can do is if we carefully write our distractors, we can pinpoint misunderstandings. So a simple example of this would be something like, let's say that my question was, what is four plus two? So of course the correct answer is six, but if two were one of my um, choices, then if someone answered two, then I would know that they were subtracting, not adding, and that would pinpoint a misunderstanding. So we can really carefully create our distractors so that we can maybe identify what our students might be doing wrong, or we can think about where is a way that a student might answer this question if they didn't have full understanding. So what are some disadvantages of multiple choice items? Um, they rely heavily on reading ability because we have to read both the question and all of the responses. Sometimes there's a higher reading load than um, other types of answer choices. Um, they're relatively difficult to write compared to things like um, select, um, constructed response items. So because we have to write all the distractors as well, they can be, they can be time consuming as a teacher to write. Um, and sometimes the understanding may be at a recall level. So because we're not asking students to construct their response, we're only asking them to identify the correct response, um, we might, they could be less challenging. So we're going to talk about guidelines now. So I'm going to go over just some really um, clear guidelines on how to write multiple choice items. And so you might want to come back to this PowerPoint as you're writing your content knowledge instrument this week and really think about and make sure that your test items that you've created follow these guidelines. So the first one is write the STEM as a clearly described question or task. 
put as much information as possible in that stem and that question. It should make sense without reading the responses. So I should be able to cover up the item responses and answer that question without reading the responses. Um, and this is so that it limits the constraints on reading. So the more information I can put in that stem, the less I have to put in all four of those answer responses. That's going to make it easier um, for our English language learners and our students with learning disabilities to answer the questions, it's going to make it's going to increase the validity of the test items for those students. So that's really important. So here's an example: Which one of these two questions is better? Photosynthesis is, or what is the process that plants use to change light to energy, or for light energy to chemical energy? And you can see in that first one, there's a million ways I can finish that sentence, photosynthesis is, right? And I'm having to read those definitions over and over again. Versus the second one, I can think about, okay, that's the definition for photosynthesis, and it's very easy for me to find that in the list. I still have to know the definition of photosynthesis. I haven't changed the difficulty of the item. I've only changed um, the, the reading level, the level of difficulty it would be if I was an English language learner or if I had a reading disability. Okay, the next one is avoid the use of negatives in a STEM. So if I use the words not or accept in that STEM and that question or item, um, it's confusing, it creates anxiety, it leads to frustration and it leads to less validity in the results. So if a student answers this question incorrectly, we don't know if it's because they didn't see the word not or the word accept, or if it's because they truly didn't understand the information. This is a good example of a question being tricky, not difficult. The only time you would want to use the words not or accept or have a negative item in the stem is when it's important um, for it for what not to do. For example, if I was teaching driver's education, I might say, um, what should I not do if I start to hydroplane? Because it's important to know that I should not hit the brakes when my car starts to skid on the water, right? Um, but if I did that, I would want to make the not really big, bolded, underlined, just to make sure my students saw it. And it's really important, um, especially for our English language learners, for our students who have reading difficulties, because they get a lot of meaning from those context clues and those nots and those accepts. Um, because they're not relying as much on those context clues, it's really easy to miss um, in, that, in that language development. So we want to avoid that as much as possible unless it's really important. Um, so again, which one of these is a better question? And of course, the first one is better because I didn't use the not. Um, and again, my advice to you when you're writing your test is to not use a not or an accept. Please don't have a negative item in your question. I know that you might in the future as a teacher use them, but if you use it in the test for this class, I'm going to think, wow, they didn't read that PowerPoint. They weren't paying attention to what I said. So please don't do it in this class. Okay, write the res correct response with no irrelevant clues. So the correct response shouldn't be longer, more elaborate, more detailed, more general, or more technical. So you guys have all done this where you've taken a multiple choice question and you, um, you didn't know the answer, but you could guess the correct answer just by looking at the answer choices and saying, oh, well, this one looks different than the others. I bet it's the correct answer, right? Good test takers do this. And the problem is, right, now we're not measuring who knows the material and who doesn't. We're measuring who can answer this test question better, right? And that's not the construct we're trying to measure. So usually some and generally are clues to the correct answer. Um, so again, how often are, are senators, uh, senator elections um, held or how often are senator elections usually held, right? So I just added that usually to the stem instead of in the answer choices and then it's really easy to find out, to find the, to um, correct for that, right? So again, just think about that. Um, just trying to make sure that we're making all of the answer choices equally plausible. Oh, oops, okay. Oh, and here's another example. So um, a synonym for altercation. And you can see um, in the first one, <laughs> in the first example, um, the first word is um, maybe 
um, a higher level word, but then the last three words are not. So we want to make sure that all of the words sound the same. They all have the same kind of higher vocabulary. Okay. Oh, so this is wrong. It actually should be the second. The second set of words is a better is a better answer for that. So my slide my slide is wrong, right? Write distractors that are plausible yet wrong. So um, unless there's um, they're useless if they're so obviously wrong that the students don't consider them. So my biggest pet peeve on a test is when a teacher writes down an answer choice like Mickey Mouse or George Washington, when it's clearly not the correct answer and they just get added as a giveaway or as something that's maybe funny or cute on a test. And the problem with this is that, that it rewards students for having cultural understanding when other students might not have that cultural understanding. And we might say, well, gosh, who doesn't know who Mickey Mouse is, right? And, and maybe that's a fair assumption, but what if you did have a student who was an English language learner, who was a recent immigrant to the United States, and they didn't know who Mickey Mouse was? Now you've put that student at a disadvantage, right? I had a friend who taught college, um, he taught archaeology, and he was so proud of himself because he wrote this test. And on the test, um, he had added the names of hockey goalies as um, as answer choices in all of his um, multiple choice questions. He was like, well, how clever was I, right? The problem is, right, this disadvantages students who don't pay attention to hockey, right? And that's a systematic disadvantage probably for his female students, right, who are less likely to follow hockey. So we don't want to do this. We don't want to add distractors that are not plausible. So um, if you only have three choices, only add three choices. It's fine. Um, try to identify those common misunderstandings. Again, think about how would a student who didn't understand this information or what's a common mistake a student might make. Um, if you can't get to four distractors, that's fine. Just add three. Um, and you can add fewer with younger children. So again, um, who's the author of the, of the yellow wallpaper? And um, you can see in that first one, Jim Carrey, um, it, that's a throwaway answer. But not every student might know who Jim Carrey is. And again, that would be a disadvantage to a student, and an unfair disadvantage. I'm not measuring what I want to measure. OK. Um, avoid using all of the above or none of the above um, or special distractors. Um, and um, Popham talks um, a lot about this in his um, in the chapter, and he disagrees with me about the um, none of the above distractor. He thinks that it maybe is fine sometimes. I think that um, I would avoid all of them, all of the above, none of the above, A and B, but not C, um, because I don't think they measure what we think that they should measure. So the problem with all of the above is that. Again, the student might pick the first choice option without reading all of the other options. So um, if I say, and we don't know then if they really did know all <laughs> the answer and they, um, and they just chose the first answer or if they really didn't understand the question. So it's, um, it weakens the validity of our question, right? And none of the above. Again, it's only relevant if we really need students to know what not to know, right? And so it just gets a little bit hazy. And then those things like A and C, but not D, it's really measuring more reasoning than knowledge. It takes longer to answer, and students um, can get wrapped up and confused rather than really measuring their knowledge. It's an example of something that's tricky rather than being difficult. Um, so again, which artist um, was part of the um, Phobos movement? And we have all of the above. And sometimes we do this because we have a hard time kind of coming up with good distractors. So we'll just add all of the above because it's easier for me to think of um, three um, full artists than to try to think of three artists that were not. So again, sometimes we do this just kind of out of what's easiest for me to write rather than really thinking deeply about writing good questions. Okay, here's another one. Again, none of the above or using all of the above. Okay, use each alternative correct the, as the correct answer about the same number of times. Again, sometimes we as teachers kind of get um, in this rut where we use B and C more often than A and D. So it's really nice at Blackboard because I can have them randomize the answer choices and so it does it automatically. I don't have to think about it. Um, 
But as teachers, we um, we just need to be careful and make sure that it is truly random. We don't want to do something cute like make every answer A on our test because what happens is, te is it really causes the students to second guess themselves. Or if there is a pattern and a student recognizes it, then they might just continue using the pattern rather than really answering the questions. And so now what we've taught them is recognizing a pattern rather than actually answering the test item. So, so really and truly just be random, use each alternative um, about the same number of times. Try again, don't just measure what you want to measure without other things. Um, so now we're going to talk about the different ways in which we can use multiple choice items to measure different levels of thinking. And for this class, I really divide this thinking into knowledge, application, and deep understanding. Just to simplify and really to think about the three main ways in which we might be assessing knowledge types. So to assess knowledge. And again, this is pretty straightforward. We can use it to measure terminology, um, like vocabulary, the knowledge of facts, um, the knowledge of principles. Um, and if we change the word, then it's comprehension. So if I use the definition straight from the textbook, that's just a basic recall of fact, right? But if I change that wording slightly, then or more or more in depth, then it's really did they understand it's really measuring that comprehension of skills, right? Um, so that's helpful. Um, I can have it measure application. So and this is a lot of what you see in our um, in the test that I give you, right? Like it's not just can you recall what the definition is, but can you apply what we've done and what we are learning about in class to a real life situation? So application, measuring how they use this knowledge in a new situation and that transfer of knowledge. And the um, the level of the newness of that task um, determines the difficulty of the task. So how new it is. So in class, if all we've done is add um, oranges and oranges, and then on the test is apples to apples, that might not be a huge transfer for students to make. But in the class, if we've done lots of addition, and then in the test, I've asked you to kind of change that addition to subtraction, that's a huge transfer of knowledge, right? So really thinking about what that application looks like um, and how that might change the difficulty of what we've done, right? Um, and then deep understanding, and I think that this is where a lot of times we kind of think, well, multiple choice really just measures um, a recall of knowledge, and there's a lot of pushback about whether or not multiple choice can measure this deep understanding, and I really do think that it can. And I think that as we've moved forward with our standardized testing and the FSAs and the, um, the you know, new world-class standards as we talked about in our first uh, module, We've seen how these multiple choice items really can try to help students, try to measure that their students' deeper understanding. So I'll, we'll go through some examples. Um, but there's kind of two ways to measure deep understanding with multiple choice items. We can focus on a particular skill of deep understanding, like asking students to identify something like fact versus opinion, which takes deeper understanding. Um, or use knowledge to perform a problem solving task. And why would I want to use multiple choice to measure deep understanding rather than something like essay or a project that we traditionally use to measure deep understanding? Well, of course, right, with a multiple choice item, I can ask so many more questions. I can get that deep, I can get that broad item sampling that I can't get with an essay or a project. Okay, so here's an example. Um, when Johnny says, stay gold, gold, pony boy, what is he asking pony boy to do? So this is a deep understanding. I really have to understand the outsiders. I have to understand what that quote was about in order to understand what um, what Johnny meant in that statement. So again, it's deep understanding of the context of the knowledge and the characters. So this is identifying assumptions. Um, another example, Peter told the group of the ill-prepared ridiculous senator had no business being involved in the debate. What Which words make Peter's statement biased? So we know the statement's bias, I have to identify why, right? So that's recognizing bias. Again, it's measuring deeper understanding. Um, and this is another example. Um, you know, if you teach elementary school and you've taught reading comprehension, you know, getting students to identify main idea is one of the more difficult things we ask them to do, right? And it's one, something I know you guys spend a lot of time on in elementary school, helping students 
conquer that skill, right? And that's because it really takes deep understanding. I have to read an entire passage and then I have to summarize it. I have to really understand that skill. So identifying main idea, that's a deep understanding, a synthesis of what they understood from the passage. Um, and then finally, here's an example of, um, of hypotheses. If there was a significant increase in the number of hawks in a given area, what would happen? to the ecosystem, I'm looking at scientific principles here, and I'd really have to understand the life cycle of, um, and the, yeah, of predator and prey, right? So again, we can use multiple choice items to measure these deeper understandings in addition to the kind of classic knowledge type items that we normally think about. So this was a summary of how to write multiple choice items. I really look forward to seeing how you apply this to your labs this week. Bye.